and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we get all the latest Sinclair news and top selling Spectrum games from August 1986. I finally get my hands on a stacked light rifle. I review some older games, take a look at a newer title, Jeff shows us another hidden gem. We catch up with the game development. And look at some serious software. But first, it's the news. David Bowie's movie, Labyrinth, is to be converted into a computer game by Activision. There is little detail at the moment, but the game is hoped to be completed by December, just in time for the festive season. As the launch of the next Spectrum, the Plus 2, is getting closer, rumours are beginning to send out mixed signals, and not all of the users are happy. The machine is said to be fully compatible with the 48K and 128K previous models, but the keyboard will be the same style as the Plus. However, the keywords will be removed, making things tricky if you want to program in 48K mode. Also, the non-standard RS-232 port of the 128 machines will be removed, but the built-in tape deck seems to be still present. Amstrad are not denying or confirming any of these rumours yet, so users will have to just wait and see. Remember that weird pop group called Sig Sig Sputnik? Well, apparently they've programmed a revolutionary new computer game and are looking for a company to market it for them. Already having approached several publishers like Demark and being turned down, they are still trying. The main problem is the band want £80,000 before even discussing anything, or even showing this alleged new game. Good luck to them. Pandora, the portable computer, planned by Clive Sinclair's company Animatic, has been put on hold pending funding. Several sample devices have been produced, and once funding is secured, production can start, but it seems no one is currently interested in paying out a few million pounds. It seems the world of computer gaming is changing. Gone are the original ideas, replaced by a deluge of licensed titles based on movies, televisions or books. Ocean have snapped up two license deals and will be producing games based on Miami Vice, the popular US cop drama, and the movie Highlander. As with most of the announcements around this time of year, they're hoping to get the games complete in time for Christmas. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. Coming into the chart this month is Molecule Man from Mastertronic. Stainless Steel from Microgen. Ping Pong from Imagine. And Way of the Tiger from Gremlin Graphics. And that was the news and top selling Spectrum games from August 1986. If there was any single advert that caught my eye in the very early days of home computing, it was probably the stack light rifle. Not only was it a gun you could use on your computer, but you could transform it into a rifle, just like the ones in all those spy movies you used to watch. When I managed to get hold of a near mint condition one for a reasonable price, I was ecstatic. However, my previous encounters with light guns have not been the best experience. The box is large and covered with exciting images of cowboys and men shooting ducks, but the real joy is when you open it up. Just look at that. How good does that look? The main gun, like the other brands previously reviewed, is pistol shaped. It's made out of plastic but it really has a solid feel to it, much stronger than the Sinclair or Magnum and even the Cheetah Defender. The interface is proprietary and does not have a pass-through port. The cable is very long too. And this is where it gets exciting. There's a barrel extension that clips onto the front. There's a rifle butt that slots into the back.
and a telescopic sight too, but that's just an empty plastic tube. But it does look good. What you end up with is a cool looking rifle. But let's start with the pistol itself. Because it's a light gun, I had to use my old CRT television, because they just don't work on modern LCD monitors. I also had to connect up my DVD recorder to capture the footage, and my cassette player to load the programs, so my small games room was very packed. The first game I loaded was Glorious 12th. Initial plays proved impossible until I had closed the curtains, turned up the contrast and blocked out any stray light or reflection. The game is a very basic duck hunt game. Single ducks fly up from the bottom of the screen and you have to shoot them. As each duck reaches the top, or gets shot, less of the screen becomes available, and this is supposed to represent daylight, and how much left of it you have. Have you noticed anything yet? There is a complete lack of screen flash, usually associated with light gun games, and this was great and very unexpected, but sadly the game was rubbish. The graphics were dull, and although the firing sound was good, there was very little to show off the hardware. Maybe the next game would be better. This game is called Gallery. Yes, it's another simple game. You have to shoot the targets before they leave the screen, using a set amount of ammo. Like the previous game, it proved tricky to line up the shots, and often you felt it was just random whether you hit it or not. Oh well, on to the next game, and High Noon. This is a little bit better, but still it's nothing special. A cowboy walks across the screen. Again, with limited ammo, you have to shoot him before he reaches the far left, and turns round and kills you. Again, it's very basic, and again, it's very difficult to line up your shots. Maybe it's because the hardware was very old, or I didn't spend enough time fine-tuning the television. I tried all of the games, with and without the rifle setup, and it didn't seem to make any difference at all. The thing that is lacking is some kind of calibration before you begin, then at least you know, based on your height and distance, where to aim to get a good shot, rather than just firing randomly at the target and hoping you're going to hit it. This was, to be honest, a huge disappointment. After waiting all these years to get my hands on this, it just wasn't worth it. There wasn't the software there to show it off. The best thing about it was the lack of screen flash, and the fact that it could turn into a rifle, but in use it was close to impossible to hit anything. The lack of games too meant that it was set to fail. There were other games announced, but none of them ever arrived, confining this wonderful looking accessory to the dusty cupboards of failure. This is Mooncrester, released by Incentive Software in 1985. One of the all-time great old-school vertical shooters has to be Mooncrester from Nichibusu. This 1980 game had all the required elements to make it a classic. A scrolling starfield, multi-section spaceship, numerous colourful aliens, mothership docking and some great sound effects. When the game was announced for the Spectrum in 1985, I hounded my local computer shop to get it so I could recreate those days in the arcade when I was crap at playing games. And sure enough, I got it, and sure enough, I was still crap at it. Having played the arcade version to get the feel for the game, I discovered I was still rubbish, but the Spectrum version was a little bit easier. The game itself is a damn fine version, and all the elements are there. There are two levels of aliens that look like eyes, but split out when hit. This is followed by two levels of galaxian type aliens. Then it's on to the docking section.
then there are two levels of large dart type aliens, followed by a load of asteroids. Then onto the fast moving balls, shall we say, that morph into darts. Complete them and the game begins again, but with tougher and faster aliens. The graphics are clear and do look like the arcade. They are smooth and react well to your control. Sound too is top notch, getting very close to the arcade machine, including the tunes. Gameplay is great, and as mentioned before it's a little more forgiving than the arcade machine, making for a very playable experience. No longer did I have to play the dirty arcade machine in the cafe halfway up the A1. I could now enjoy it in my own home. I spent ages playing this game, and kept going back for more. This then is not only a classic shooter in the arcade, but also on the spectrum. This is Street Gang Football, released by Codemasters in 1989. I never liked or enjoyed football games for any computer or console. That's why they've never appeared in the show before, but I guess to be balanced I'd better include one, so why not this one? You play against a computer, or another person, in what is described as a streetwise football simulator. The game takes place, as the title suggests, in a street, and that includes cars, manholes, buildings and the usual street stuff. This means that the pitch is somewhat unconventional, but then again so is the game, as the rules don't apply, and you are free to beat up the other team, as they are to beat up you. Codemasters have tried to mix street football with a beat-em-up, and I'm not sure it really worked. There's no actual fighting involved. After choosing your preferred control, it's onto the game. The view is from above and slightly forward, which looks good, and all the graphics including the players are well drawn. The screen scrolls in all directions, and the gameplay is as we've all come to expect from football games. The player you control is highlighted with a number above his head. You can switch to another player by pressing the kick button, or if you're using a joystick, the fire button. Once you get the ball, if you can, you can run and dribble, or kick it down the pitch. Holding the kick key will mean a longer kick. Scoring is quite tricky, probably because I'm pretty rubbish at football games, and after 10 or so games I never managed to score a goal. While recording the video though, I managed to score two. And talking of goals, when the other team get close to your goal, the control is switched to the goalkeeper, which is fair enough I suppose, but if the ball is just outside the area, you are left waiting for the other team to collect it and score. Because it's in the street there are no rules, there are no throw-ins, no free kicks, no penalties, just a continuous run and shoot game, which keeps the pace going. The game has various options you can set, including difficulty and length of game. By the end of my playing time I had got a little more accustomed to the controls, and actually did manage to score a few goals. So it's not a bad game once you get used to it, and of course if you like football games, which I don't. And because of that I doubt I'll be playing it again. This is 3D Lunar Crabs, released by Micromega in 1983, and written by Mervyn Escort. As part of the Solar System Resources research team, you have landed on one of Saturn's moons, and are prospecting for precious minerals. Suddenly your biosensor starts to go crazy, and you see movement in the distant rocks. Yes, it's the dreaded Lunar Crabs. Using your cannon you have to try and survive for as long as you can, which is tricky as the crabs start to spit acid at you. The graphics as you can see are very impressive for a 1983 game, especially one that's 16k. The crabs move about, often scuttling behind rocks, and occasionally getting closer to start spitting acid, and there's some nice 3D going on there. The landscape scrolls left and right as well, and you can sometimes see your spaceship in the distance. Sadly you never get to it though, 
as this is just a straight shooting game. Sound is used well with some nice effects, and the gameplay is easy enough to allow you to progress, if that's the right word, because it's just a matter of survival really, and racking up a huge score. You do get bonuses for killing a certain number of crabs, but they soon come back for more, and it's very easy to lose focus while chasing one of the little blighters, and you soon find yourself covered in spit, which isn't very nice. I like this game. It's simple, well written and great fun. Why not give it a try? In 1992 I released an Amiga PD game called Baldy, and since then I've tried many times to make a Spectrum conversion, but I finally managed it this year, in 2015. So here is Baldy ZX. It's a very simple yet unique platform game. There are a set number of fixed platforms that Baldy can use, some are blocked by spikes and deadly traps though, and some have teleports that allow Baldy to transport to the platform above or below him. Using these he has to navigate each level and collect a set number of tapes. Things aren't that easy though, as there are various moving enemies that change with each level, and they include things like flying plant pots, skulls, lemmings and arrows. The game has 20 levels, with the first 10 being identical to the Amiga version. As a conversion I would say it's pretty good. The graphics are well drawn and move smoothly, sound is good playing effects for jumping, teleporting, collecting and dying, so there's a good range. Control is simple too with left, right, crouch and teleport. Crouching allows Baldy to duck under certain objects, but not all of them, so you have to be careful. A good game then, that you should have a go at. Hello and welcome to Hidden Gems. In this section we take a look at some games that aren't as well known but are still superb and well worth picking up and playing even today. And this time we're going to look at a fiendishly addictive puzzle game called Mushroom Man. And when I say addictive, I really mean addictive. This game should come with a warning. I've been playing this game on a bus or a train and almost missed my stop. It really, really is that addictive and that absorbing. Mushroom Man was released in 2009 and was one of the entries into the ZX Spectrum Crap Games competition that runs every year and is in fact a port of a Windows game also called Mushroom Man by Paul E. Collins. The game was written by a Dutch gentleman called Heiju Spunenup. I think that's how you pronounce his name anyway. And like all the games in this series, it's available for download at the World of Spectrum website. One warning, if you want to play the game on original hardware, you will need a 1 to 8K or a normal plus 2 Spectrum. It won't run on a 48K Spectrum and it won't run on a plus 2A or a plus 3. Gameplay wise, it's pretty simple. You are the Mushroom Man and you move around your area, always contained on one screen, no scrolling areas on this picking up objects that you can then use to change your environment you can pick up keys which open locks you can pick up money which you use to bribe guards you can pick up air which you use to move through water you can use guns and bombs to blow up walls or guards or money or keys or any of the objects that are in the game there are some unbreakable walls that can't be destroyed with your ultimate aim being to try and get to the exit. You'll also find that various levels have 
teleportation devices that can help you get to the exit as well. Now the game has a terrific difficulty curve. You start off and the first few levels are basically tutorials. They teach you how the game works, teach you how to reach the exit and use the various objects, keys, money, bombs, etc. But pretty soon you start to get to more challenging levels and they just get harder and harder and harder and some are a real challenge and will have you scratching your head for ages. There is one in particular called a drowning pool that had me stumped for days. I kept trying to do it and just couldn't find out how to do it, couldn't work out the puzzle. It took me ages and ages to do and you get a real sense of satisfaction when you do manage to complete levels like that. And as I hinted at earlier, it's a terrific game if you're on a long journey. If you're on a bus journey or you're on a train journey that's going to take quite a while and you have some method of emulating the spectrum in this game on it, just get it out and play it. It is absolutely wonderful. The time will just slip away and you'll find yourself at your destination before you know it. As with some of the other games in this series, if you're just a shoot up fan and you love shoot ups and don't like to play any other kind of game, this game won't be for you. And again, as with a lot of the other games in this series, if you have to have beautiful graphics, this game won't be for you. I read an online review of this game where someone said the first thing that strikes you is how bad the graphics actually are. But despite that, the reviewer absolutely loved the game and recommended everyone go out and play play and I do exactly the same and if you do start playing this and get stuck one of the things I would say is that the solution to the first 140 levels are on my YouTube channel. The game does get a bit buggy in the later levels and actually I haven't been able to complete any more levels than that due to those bugs but those 140 levels should be enough to keep anyone going for quite some time. The level I mentioned previously the drowning pool is level 80 and if you get that far and can complete that level then I take my hat off to you. As I said, it took me quite a considerable amount of time to work out. It's quite fiendishly difficult. So that's Mushroom Man, a game that was created for the Crap Games competition that is far from crap. Until next time, happy gaming! Welcome to the continued Diary of Berserk, a game written by Jason Billow. Last month Jason was having problems with speed, mainly because the game was using BASIC. To overcome this, he would have to use machine code for certain parts, or even all of the game. The first thing he looked at was the drawing of the walls for each screen. And after a few hours work, he had a very fast method of producing the random walls. Here is what he came up with. The BASIC equivalent is on the left, and the machine code is on the right. Now I don't even pretend to understand any of this, but I hope it's useful to some of you. To try and explain things, the spectrum screen is 256 by 192 pixels, followed by 32 by 24 attribute blocks. The start address of the screen is 16384, so with a bit of maths, we can get the start of the attribute display, which is 22528. From here we can map each 8 by 8 pixel block and draw the required walls, and the result is a super fast screen draw. The next task was to optimise the remaining basic code, and to try and improve that. Jason changed the input from using inkis to using the in command, and this allowed multiple key presses to be detected, which means the player can move and fire at the same time. He then discovered a problem. The random nature of the maze generator sometimes meant that the player could be blocked in, so a quick change to the code made sure that that never happened. Next was the speed of the player. Still slow, and the reason was the number of if-then statements required. Sometimes the basic interpreter had to iterate through 36 of them before doing anything. Jason added exit points where he could to try and stop this happening, and he also optimised the order in which the statements were executed, and eventually got the number down from a maximum of 36 to just 5, a huge improvement. After a lot of work, his optimization of the if-then statements would also affect the implementation of the robots when he did that, because that also may prove too slow. And if this is the case, he may have to move those to machine code as well. Find out what happens next month. There have been many paint programs for the Spectrum, but my package of choice in the 80s was this one, Paintbox from Print and Plotter. It was released in 1983 and came with some very useful additions. The main menu has three options, and we'll go through each of them. First is the UDG editor, or user-definable graphics, but there is a difference with this one. 
Not only can you edit the standard 21 UDGs, but also three other banks, giving you four in total. You can view the ones supplied, switch or save the current bank, and then go back and start editing them. The editor is simple enough, giving you the usual move and paint functions. You can also rotate, invert or mirror the current one before saving it, which is quite useful. Once you have created some of the graphics, you can then try them out using the sketchpad. This is a useful feature, as you can see how they fit together before saving them. Once you have your complete set, saving them to tape is easy. You can then load them into your basic game, and when loaded, it will give you 84 user-definable graphics to use instead of the standard 21. On to the next option then, and the precision plotter. Here we have a standard drawing tool. You can use lines, curves, circles, arcs and fills. It does lack any kind of pattern fill though, which is a shame. But the controls are easy, and once you get to know what the keys do, you can quickly start creating pictures. You can store the screen, at any stage, in memory, in case you make a mistake. And this lets you recall it instantly. The other things missing are things like magnify, that let you work on small detail and a fast move option. If you are moving the cursor all the way across the screen, it can take over 15 seconds to get there. Which is a bit of a pain really. On to the last option then, and screen planner. And this allows you to mix the two previous functions together. So you can display the screen that you created in Precision Plotter, and paste on top of it the user definable graphics you created earlier. This is a good idea, and makes things like a repeating border quite easy to do. Overall then, a good package with some nice features, but sadly lacking in certain areas. Well that's the end of this episode, I hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching. Get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon.